I was so lucky to grow up in Charleston in the 1950s. Every summer, my family would pack up the car and drive to our beach house on Sullivan's Island. My mother would be firmly in charge of this maneuver, as you can see. My sister and I would jump in the front seat, I would get the window seat, and we'd drive the 12 miles out to the beach. That was sort of my first perspective of the city. I'd look out the window at the buildings going by, the homes and the Upper King Street buildings, and I just loved it. And then finally we would travel across town and we would enter the east side community. And my mother would tell us to roll up the windows and lock the doors. I'm not sure if it was out of fear or just the anticipation of going over this old bridge. That was pretty terrifying, but I loved that part too. Today we have a brand new bridge. And it marks the renaissance of all the change that we see happening in Charleston right now. These cranes have come into the picture. Everywhere we look, we see these monsters that have come in to build new buildings, new hotels and restaurants. At first, there were just a couple of them, but now they seem to be everywhere, especially in the upper part of the peninsula. I was really curious to see how this affected people who lived below them who were living in the neighborhoods like the East Side. The East Side neighborhood is a very old and historic place. A lot of pride, a lot of heritage there, and it's always been a very diverse community. And as I was walking through this neighborhood, photographing it, I realized that the buildings are gonna be fine. In fact, we preserve those, we rebuild them but the people who were going to be moving into them were going to be different. About that time, I see a man sitting in front of his house. And I went over to him, I introduced myself, and he told me his name was Henry, and he'd been living there for about 60 years. In our conversation, he told me stories about being there that long and what it was like then and now. And he said it's a better place now but people seem to be different. They walk by and he sort of feels invisible because people are not saying, hello, how you doing? Or even, you know, nodding at him. Folks are looking down at their phones as they walk by. And the phones sort of represent those windows in cars that we roll up because it's a way that we don't engage each other. It's sort of a, what we use to block that possibility of making eye contact. So I knew that my project was going to be about people. And I asked Henry, can I come back tomorrow and do a portrait of you? And he said, sure, I'll be right here. So the next day I came back, but I wanted to do this differently. I wanted to, to do a different perspective of people. So I brought back with me this white tent. It's like a portable photo studio. And what it did was it took in the sunlight and it diffused it. It made the person standing there just beautiful. And I could set this up anywhere, any time of day. All I needed was the sun shining. So I asked Henry at that point, don't smile, but think about something that makes you happy. Think about somebody that you love. And in that instant, I made this first portrait. And then a few minutes later, another man who was watching this going on came by and stepped into the, the studio. And his name was Mr. Robert. And he told me stories. I really was hooked at this point. I wanted to photograph more and more people. Because every time somebody walked in, it resulted in this wonderful, soft, beautiful photograph that sort of showed the inner person. I moved this tent around and I met people from all over. This young man on the left is from Egypt. His family have a limousine service on the east side and this is his best friend home from college. I was stopped into a little restaurant called Hannibal's, a very popular place there. And while I was there for lunch, 
people ask me, what are you doing with that tent and the camera? And I told them I was doing a portrait project on people who lived on the east side. That was the only thing, you had to live on the east side. And people were raising their hands and they said, I do, I'll, I'll be a part of that. And then this woman with this little child came out and the little five-year-old little girl stood there in this tent. And I gave her that same instruction to think about somebody she loved and to play with that little pigtail. <laughs> Over the next month or more, I was coming back, usually on Saturdays and Sundays, when I met Sister Wendy. I didn't have to ask Sister Wendy to think about who she loved. And I met the folks from really all over the world, from Jamaica and from Barbados. So after a while, I could see how the neighborhood was changing. And I also, I promised everybody that I was going to have an exhibit. They had all been invited. So far, they had not even seen these pictures yet. So I thought about it, and I'm thinking, where will I display these pictures, these wonderful pictures of these children and these adults, so that they would be sure to see them. So the answer to that was right in front of me on Columbus Street. This stretch of fence surrounds a, a now closed elementary school. So I called the school district and asked permission. And they said, fine, you go ahead. So I got to work. And I blew the pictures up four by five feet and put them on a waterproof material so they would last through the rain and so forth. And with the help of friends, we put them all up. And they stretched 125 feet along Columbus Street to America Street. And the next day, I just kind of waited to see what was going to happen. Folks stopped their cars, or they rolled down their windows, and they got out to walk along this fence. And life was going on, but a lot of the folks living there knew something was different. And it was, because now the neighborhood had a face on it. And people kept coming by over and over again. Over the next almost three months, thousands and thousands of cars came by that stretch of street there. The traffic count on that street is like 5,000 a day. And I did the math and it was like, you know, half a million people over about a 100 day period. But the ones that were affected the most were the commuters, the people who were coming by that street twice a day. They had never seen anything like this and they now had something to look forward to, either coming to work and going home. It formed a solidarity throughout the whole neighborhood. It made it into a community of people. And I really learned that by taking away any kind of preconceived notion that you have about a whole neighborhood and looking at people one person at a time will result in a better understanding of everybody. That if we all did this, that we could understand that going back to Henry, that he's just one person, that people are just not noticing. And at the end of this talk, I'll bet you may not even remember my name, but I'll bet you'll remember at least one of these faces. And the way that you can see a lot more is just to roll down your window and unlock your door. Thank you.